number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right. In the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were. Of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that. So they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah, yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the middle ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Drafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never ending rave. Initially physicians thought folks were just stressed out so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point they were like we better cut this off and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools.
Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like this is a sin. But despite the ban it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean technically they're already wearing kind of dresses. Their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting though is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So, bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh wow what's happening, their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the black dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title I have to say, football, because football, had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could you could do absolutely 
absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either, because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. Onto something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well, and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes, and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. 
because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So, you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage rite. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. 
Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chain mail. My knees would buckle, no thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, 
Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not 
It's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible, they're not really a thing, they didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming, so maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck, piles of it, just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of, eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad.